Hey there, welcome back to Short Takes 331. Today we're going to talk about a 1D Green's function example, and we're going to do that in two different ways. So to fix ideas, we're going to focus on this operator given by the second derivative with respect to our variable x and with a minus sign. And this is an operator that is relevant for quantum mechanics and general wave equations and a lot of other applications. And we will work with this operator in a space of functions that uh, vanish at our origin and vanish at some point L. And so we satisfy them these boundary conditions. And whenever you're given an operator, uh, uh, you should always ask about the boundary conditions. The re really, the, the whole problem is not completely set until you're given not just the operator, but also the boundary conditions. And it's very common for people to show you some wave equation or something and then not give you the boundary conditions. So you should always ask about that. Now, what is the Green's function and what's the purpose of having it? Well, uh, the Green's function is, is the function such that when we apply our operator to it, we get the delta function. That's a simple story. And if you recall from a previous video, the delta function really is like a unit matrix, if you want. It's a kind of uh, identity uh, matrix or identity operator. And so what we're looking for in G is really the inverse of our operator A. Why is this important? Well, having the inverse of an operator is very powerful. So if we have the solution to this equation, then we can solve uh, any problem of this type, our operator applied to a function given, uh, uh, or rather our operator applied to a function is equal to a given function h, we need to find f, and h is given to us with the uh, agreed boundary conditions, and, and then this problem can be solved immediately if you have g of x, x prime. So that is uh, done by convolution, and, and then our result, or our, um, the answer to this problem is f of x equals to the integral from 0 to l, g of x x prime, h of x prime, g x prime. And so you do this integral and you obtain your result. I'm not saying this integral is easy. It could be difficult depending on what h is and depending on what g is, of course. But uh, formally, this would be your solution because if you apply the second derivative operator with a minus sign to this, you recover the delta and you do the integral trivially and you obtain h of x. And so you, you satisfy this equation by construction. Now, uh, how, we do, how we're gonna find g of x x prime uh, that's going to be a part of our task. Notice that when we go into solving that problem, something weird happens as x equal to x prime. Uh, this equation becomes very simple if x is not equal to x prime because the right-hand side is zero, and so we have second derivative equal to zero on both sides of x prime, if you want. And, uh, and, and so something weird happens at x equal to x prime that we need to account for. And the other thing is that we have two variables appearing. So if you're used to ordinary differential equations, so equations with only one variable, uh, and appearing the derivative, then then uh, now two variables may appear scary. Just think of x prime as a parameter and x as your variable. So x prime is just the parameter that's along for the ride. If you prefer to call it lambda, then call it lambda. And so imagine that this g then really depends on x, the derivative is with respect to x, and then the x prime is just along for the ride on both sides of the equation. So how are we going to solve this? The first thing is we need to deal with this weirdness at x equal to x prime. So what happens with this infinity? Uh, that appears at x equal to x prime. And to do that, we, we of course make use of the property of the delta that when you integrate it uh, around uh, this x prime point, if you integrate in x, then you get one. So you get you integrate around the point where the delta saturates and you get one. And on the right hand side, you also do the integral, but you have a derivative. Of course, the minus sign goes right through the integral, that doesn't matter, uh, we'll, we'll put it over here. But, uh, but you have an integral of a derivative, and so in fact, it's a second derivative, and so the result is simply the function, uh, the first derivative now evaluated at the endpoints of the integral. And so what we obtain from this result is that by virtue of our defining equation for the Green's function, we get that the first derivative of g with respect to x has to have a discontinuity at uh, x equal to x prime. And if I put the minus sign on the other side of the equation, then I get that the discontinuity between the right side of x prime and the left side of x prime it has to be minus one. And we will use that. We'll also assume that g itself has no problems. We'll assume that it's continuous at x equal to x prime. There's no reason uh, from this equation to, to uh, assume that g is, itself is not continuous. Certainly the derivative has to be discontinuous. We just proved that. But there's no reason to believe that g itself has to have any problems. And so we move forward with that. And so how do we find g of x x prime? Well, uh, as I was saying before, we uh, look at x, minus, uh, x less than x prime. First, then the right-hand side simplifies, so we get zero, which means that our function is linear in x. And so we write a generic function that is linear in x. Now, of course, this x prime is a parameter, and so our, our um, slope and, and our other our constant, our value at the origin, 
uh, at x equal to zero, ha they have to be functions of our parameter x prime. And so we write this uh, general form for our uh, g of x, x prime. This is the most general form you can find uh, if the second derivative vanishes. It has to be just a line like this in x. And we'll see what happens with these functions of x prime. Uh, first of all, we know that at the origin, the function has to vanish. Those are our boundary conditions. So remember, our variable is x. If we evaluate at x equal to 0, it has to vanish. This tells us that b is 0. And so we get that g of x, x prime is simply this function of x prime that we'll find out what it is and, uh, and multiply by x. So far, so good. We made a bit of progress. On the other side of the interval, at x greater than x prime, you do the same thing. You propose a form that is linear in x. You apply the boundary conditions, and you obtain a relationship between c and d that tells you that g of x, x prime on the, in that region is simply a function c of x prime, which we'll find. We'll have to determine what it is, multiplied by x minus l. So this makes sure that we vanish at x equal to l. And now uh, we have the one point that we left out, which is x equal to x prime. And there is where we are going to enforce continuity and the discontinuity in g prime. So the continuity of g tells us that our right-hand side, or other, actually left-hand side, uh, a of x uh, times x, left, left side of the interval, evaluated in x prime equal to x, has to be equal to this other function evaluated at x prime equal to x, and so that's the equation here. And from here, we obtain that a of x is c of x times x minus l divided by x. So we obtain one equation uh, for these uh, unknowns a and c. And from the discontinuity in g prime, that the, the jump has to be equal to minus 1. I took a first derivative with respect to x on the right side of the of x prime and on the left side of x prime and I subtracted the two that has to be minus one again remember that was our condition that we derived up here that's all I'm saying and this minus is because uh, this minus goes here and that's why it's minus one and uh, and once you you apply that result you obtain then two equations with two unknowns a and c and if you solve those you get that c is x over l with the minus sign so minus x over l now that we have C, we can put it in here, you obtain A, and so you have C and A, and you have the final result. So this is collecting uh, all those results and, and uh, applying our solution on both sides of X prime and the continuity and the discontinuity conditions at X equal to X prime. It's very simple. Uh, it's it's uh, not difficult uh, algebra at all. It involves, in fact, doesn't even involve any, anything quadratic. Everything is linear. Uh, and, uh, uh, but of course, once we get to this, we, get, we see some of the richness of this result because uh, putting everything together we get 1 minus x prime over l times x for x less than x prime uh, now as a function of x notice that x prime over l is always less than 1 and so this is going to be a positive slope this is going to be a positive line for x less than x prime and on the other side as a function of x now we have a minus 1 here and x prime is a positive number and so we have a negative slope in x uh, when x is greater than x prime. So if you were to plot this as a function of x for some value of x prime, you see a positive slope first and then a negative slope. And we're going to plot this later. Also notice that this function is uh, symmetric in x and x prime. This is a property that is inherited uh, from the operator that we're working with, the second derivative operator. And uh, you will see more of that uh, hopefully in a future video. So another way to find g, this is the second way, I promised two ways. So this is, this is the second way then. Uh, recall that we, this is our problem. We have this operator. We have the boundary conditions being f of 0 equals f of l equal to 0. So we live in a, f a space of functions that vanish at 0 and an l. And I, I didn't mention it before, but of course we have to live in a space of functions that are at least twice differentiable. So this operator would uh, make sense. And now we're looking for the inverse of the operator, as, as I said before. And if you saw the previous video on inverses, you will probably recall that um, we can do this with eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Uh, and actually, the, the video on inverses may not have that information, eigenvectors and eigenvalues. But if you do watch the one on eigenvectors and eigenvalues, there's a couple of those you'll find that uh, basically this is described there, the solution for the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this operator with these boundary conditions. And I don't think I calculated that constant in front in that video. But, uh, but it's here. It's square root of 2 over l times the sine of k pi l uh, over uh, times x k pi over l times x, and then lambda k is k pi over l quantity squared. And here it is k that appears here is, of course, the index of the eigenvalue on the eigenvector and starts at 1 and goes all the way to infinity and takes on uh, integer values 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to infinity. Um, 
you do not want to have a k equal to zero, of course. Uh, well, first of all, k, uh, lambda k would be zero, but there's no problem there. It's fine if you if you have a zero eigenvalue. Uh, generally, that's allowed. But you cannot have a completely vanishing eigenvector. Uh, that's not a proper eigenvector. So, so if you set k equal to zero here, this whole thing will vanish, and so you would not really have an eigenvector. Of course, zero equals zero is a trivial solution of the eigenvector equation. That's not, but that's not what we want. And um, if you have uh, uh, these uh, these results, then, then you're in a very powerful position because then you, the, the inverse of the operator applied to a function will take this convolution form that we saw before with g given by this uh, form in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So it's the sum over all the eigenvectors and then eigenvector k evaluated at x, lambda k inverse, so the eigenvalue inverse, times the eigenvector, once again, evaluated at x prime and complex conjugated. And if you put that explicitly in terms of what we know up here, then the complex conjugate, of course, doesn't play any role because this is all real, so that's fine. But then we get 2 over L sum from k equals 1 to infinity uh, times the uh, sine of k pi over L x, L over k pi quantity squared, sine of k pi over L times uh, x prime. And uh, this looks like a very complicated expression. Uh, how come we didn't end up with something as simple as this? Although this is piecewise defined, it's just uh, a line. If you want, it's a it's bilinear, uh, uh, it's linear in x and it's linear in x prime. So, so what's going on? Well, this is uh, you may regard this as a simple formula for this complicated sum of signs and with these uh, with these coefficients. Uh, it, it turns out that if you go ahead and plot that, uh, you can do I do I did that here. You can do it yourself with Mathematica, for example. Uh, and and then the exact result, the two lines uh, that I described before, are here, shown here in blue. Uh, by the way, I took here L equal to 1 and X prime equal to 1 third, and so I'm plotting G of X, X prime as a function of X, as I anticipated. But this is the exact result in blue. So one line up to 1 third, and then a, a decaying line uh, the, 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 with, with a negative slope uh, beyond that. And if you were to, instead of taking uh, X prime equal to 1 third, like I did here, you were to take uh, X prime equal to 1 half, then this line would go up to 1 half, and then it would go down. But for this value and, and uh, L equal to 1, like I did here, just to fix ideas, if you start summing this sum, then you would obtain a, a curve that looks like the orange curve here for K max equals to 2. So just two terms here would give you this uh, smooth approximation. Of course, uh, this uh, functions sine of X, uh, sine of K pi over L X, uh, and, and the sine with K pi over L X prime, they're both very smooth functions. They're infinitely differentiable. They have no discontinuities like this. So you really only recover the discontinuity of the exact answer when you sum all the way to infinity. And, uh, and, and you start to see that that starts to develop uh, slowly, and, and this is k max equal to 2, and in green you see k max equal to 10. Uh, if you start summing uh, 20, 40, 100 terms, you start to see how really this, uh, the curve uh, really becomes very, very, very close to these lines. But over here, close to that, uh, that kink in the curve, you, uh, you see that uh, our, our result is always going to be smooth unless we sum all the way to infinity. And that's it. Those are the two ways in which you can find the Green's function in 1D for this second derivative operator with this hard wall boundary conditions. That's all I have for you today. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Uh, if you're looking for a tutor in physics or math in English or in Spanish, you can contact me at shorttext331 at gmail.com or you can leave a comment in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.